Hi folks, this is Alan Heckman from the Physician Assistant Program at the Sales University. We're going to be talking about myasthenia gravis today. So myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular disorder characterized by weakness and fatigability of skeletal muscles. And that is the hallmark definition of this condition here, is the weakness and fatigability. The underlying defect in this disease is a decrease in the number of acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. And this is believed to be caused by an autoimmune process. All right, let's just review some basic physiology here of the motor end plate. Acetylcholine is synthesized at the motor nerve terminals and is stored in vesicles. When an action potential travels down a motor nerve, it reaches the terminal, at which point acetylcholine is released from the vesicles into the synaptic cleft. There, it's going to travel and it's going to bind with the acetylcholine receptors. This causes channels to open up and you get sodium to flow in, which produces depolarization at the motor end plate. If depolarization is sufficient, it initiates a response. In this, in this particular situation, you'd get contraction of the muscle. Now, this process is terminated then by hydrolysis of the acetylcholine by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, which is present within the synaptic fold. This allows you to contract the muscle and then release it as appropriate. Now, in patients with myasthenia gravis, their defect is a decrease in the number of available acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic cleft. So here the synaptic folds are misshaped and that results in decreased efficiency of the transmission. Acetylcholine is released normally from the presynaptic membrane. The problem here is in the postsynaptic side here. So we don't have enough receptors so we release acetylcholine, we don't have enough receptors, and not having enough receptors may actually cause a failed depolarization or a failed action potential to result here. And that gives us the result of muscle weakness, a, a, a poor contraction of the muscle. Here's a diagram depicting the normal anatomy and physiology versus a patient with myasthenia gravis. As you can see here, there's all these acetylcholine receptors that you can find here in the postsynaptic cleft here, all right? So acetylcholine is stored in these vesicles here. When the nerve impulse travels down the nerve here, it stimulates these vesicles and it releases acetylcholine. It flows across the synaptic cleft where it is picked up by these um, acetylcholine receptors here, and that triggers the action potential and the muscle contraction. However, in somebody with myasthenia gravis, all right, we still have the same amount of vesicles here, the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. However, you can see here we have a reduced amount of receptors available to receive the neurotransmitter. And we have a little bit of, of a change here in the anatomic structure of the postsynaptic cleft as well. This results in a decreased amount of neuroreceptors hitting these sites and causing the desired contraction that we're looking for. Now, in addition to the pathophysiology that takes place in a patient with myasthenia gravis. The amount of acetylcholine released per impulse normally declines on repeated activity. So the more firing you have in rapid succession, the less acetylcholine is being released. Now in myasthenia gravis patients, the decrease in the efficiency of the neuromuscular transmission, which was already there, combined with normal rundown, meaning we're losing acetylcholine because of rapid firing, results in an activation of fewer and fewer muscle fibers. And this leads to increased weakness or what we call myasthenic fatigue. Let me show you here what I'm talking about. I'm going to shrink this down here for you. So in a patient here who normally fires, let's just say for one impulse here, we have a bunch of acetylcholine available here to fire. And that's with muscle contraction, number one. Now, it's already weakened because of our um, 
lack of receptors that are there. So we keep trying to contract and contract because we're already weak and we're trying to overcome that weakness. But the next time it fires, our vesicles haven't had a chance to restore acetylcholine that fast. So as a result, we have less and less acetylcholine that's being sent into the postsynaptic cleft. And then we keep trying to contract again, and now we've got less and less acetylcholine that's available for contraction, and this results in increased weakness. So in addition to the underlying pathophysiology of myasthenia gravis, we have our own what's called rundown here of every time we try to fire in rapid succession, we have reduced amount of acetylcholine available because it, it hasn't had a chance to reproduce and fill back up again. So this results in even further increased weakness in these patients. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the reason why these folks are in the condition that they're in is because of an underlying autoimmune process, which they believe is a response mediated by a specific anti-acetylcholine or acetylcholine receptor antibody. And these antibodies reduce the number of available receptor sites at the neuromuscular junction by accelerating the turnover of the receptors, damaging the postsynaptic membrane, and then they block the active sites of the receptors that are available. What we know about this is the pathogenic antibodies are IgG and T-cell dependent. And when we do immunotherapy for folks with this disease, we direct it against the antibody-producing B-cells, or helper T-cells. It's not understood what is the response or what is the initiation of the autoimmune reaction, but some people believe that the thymus plays a role in this process. Here's what we know. The thymus is abnormal in about 75% of patients with myasthenia gravis. 65% of these folks, the thymus is hyperplastic, not necessarily enlarged. 10% of these patients then have tumors that are there. Now, when we actually look at the cells here of the thymus, these, these myoid cells have acetylcholine receptors on their surface, which may serve as a source or trigger of the autoimmune reaction. All right, let's move on to a little bit of uh, epidemiology information here for you. This disease is not rare. In fact, it, prevalence is, is pretty common, uh, about 2 to 7 people out of 10,000. Um, and it can affect anybody of any age group, but it tends to peak in women in their 20s and men around 50s and 60s. The disease is more commonly seen in women than men. As stated on the first slide, the cardinal features of this disease are weakness and fatigue ability of muscles. Weakness increases during repeated use or late in the day and typically gets better following rest and sleep. The course of disease is completely variable. Everybody is different, which is why you'll learn later on that the treatment for this disease is going to be individualized. Exacerbations and remissions can occur, uh, most commonly in the first few years of the disease as you're trying to get the disease under control with medications. The muscle weakness associated with the disease tends to follow a characteristic pattern. You will typically see weakness in the cranial muscles, particularly uh, of the, the lids and extraocular muscles. Why? Because we use these muscles so often. Think about how often you're blinking every minute. Think about how often you're moving your eyes. This, this disease is not specific to limbs. It's, it's specific to skeletal muscles. So if you're moving the eyes and you're blinking a lot, you're going to get weakness, which can lead to diplopia and ptosis. Those are common features there. In addition, because we're using our mouths all the time to eat and smile and talk and communicate, this also can give you some uh, weakening of these muscles here and give you some changes to your facial expressions. In addition, you can have weakness in your chewing, changes in your speech, difficulty swallowing from using these muscles over and over. Uh, limb weakness is noted to be often proximal and typically asymmetric. And that's pretty common. About 85% of these patients will develop some type of generalized weakness as well. Now, uh, this is an interesting tidbit here. If the weakness remains restricted to the extraocular muscles for three years, and you're not finding this weakness anywhere else, it is likely that the weakness will not 
become generalized. That's pretty interesting. Uh, you also need to pay attention to uh, respiratory muscles uh, because a lot of those muscles that we use are skeletal muscle in nature and if weakness comes from breathing or uh, you could get fatigue of those muscles and it could suppress your drive to breathe. And some of these folks uh, do require a uh, ventilator when they're in what we call a myasthenia crisis situation. Initially, the diagnosis is made on your suspicion based on a patient's complaints and physical exam findings. And they should be complaining of weakness and fatigability, but you should not find any loss of reflexes. They should not have an impairment of sensation, and they should not have any other focal neurologic findings on exam. The diagnosis, however, should be confirmed before you start treatment. You want to rule out any other process that could be causing this or that appears similar to this because the treatment for myasthenia gravis can be rather invasive and you want to make sure that you have the right disease before you initiate the process of treatment. There are diagnostic studies available to help you in determining if the patient has myasthenia gravis. You can assess for anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies. These are typically found in about 85% of patients. However, a negative test does not exclude the disease. Um, obviously, you can have about 15% of patients that don't have a positive test that do have the disease. Uh, in addition, the level of antibodies does not signify the severity of the disease. So if you have a high level versus a low level, it doesn't show whether you have more of the disease or less of the disease. Uh, you can see some elevated levels during exacerbations and decreased levels, though, during remissions. Repetitive nerve stimulation with electrodiagnostic testing can help provide evidence to suggest the patient has myasthenia gravis. Here, electric shocks are delivered and action potentials are then measured. A rapid reduction in the amplitude of the action potentials is noted and may suggest the patient has myasthenia gravis. Edrophonium is an acetylcholine esterase medication that can be used as a test to see if a patient might have evidence of myasthenia gravis. This medication is a relatively short half-life, so it works well. You give it to the patient, and it typically has an onset of about 30 minutes and lasts for about 5 minutes. And what you're looking for is an improvement of the patient's weakness. That would be a positive sign. A positive response is considered to be diagnostic for myasthenia gravis. That should be MG, not MD there. A negative response, you can repeat it with higher doses to see if that also might be indicative of myasthenia gravis. This test is used for patients with suspicion of MG with a negative antibody and a negative electrodiagnostic test. Inherited myasthenic syndromes is very similar to myasthenia gravis. However, this is being caused by a genetic problem, not an autoimmune problem. Uh, this is a heterogeneous group of disorders that affect the neuromuscular junction, very similar to myasthenia gravis. They share the same symptoms, but this is being caused by a genetic mutation, okay, in any part of the neuromuscular junction, not just at the postsynaptic terminal here. This should be suspected in anybody with myasthenia gravis symptoms noted in infancy or early childhood with negative antibody tests. So if you have a kid who you suspect myasthenia gravis in with a negative antibody test, you should consider this congenital myasthenic syndrome. Now, as I mentioned earlier, about 75% of patients with myasthenia gravis have some type of thymic abnormality. Neoplastic changes, a.k.a. a thymoma, uh, can produce enlargement of the thymus, and that can potentially be seen sometimes in people with myasthenia gravis. Uh, remember that the thymus is large in the pediatric population and will be seen on neuroimaging. However, you shouldn't see it on an adult. If you're seeing enlargement of the thymus uh, on a patient greater than 40 years old, you should suspect a thymoma at that point, whether it's um, cancerous or not cancerous, you should just suspect that there's a mass there and that needs further evaluation. Hyperthyroidism is seen in about 3 to 8 percent of patients with myasthenia gravis and so when you're doing your workup in this process you should get a TSH and just confirm that the thyroid function is normal. In addition, 
Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder, and as I've stated to you many times, where there's one autoimmune disorder, there's likely to be other ones as well. So you should consider other autoimmune processes in this workup as well. Um, the last bullet point here just talks about measuring ventilatory function. Remember that folks with myasthenia gravis, if it starts to affect the respiratory muscles, it will decrease their ability to breathe. Keeping an eye on this function is going to be real important, and you can use it to predict if a patient's crisis is about to take place and they might need mechanical ventilation. Myasthenia gravis is a treatable disease, and folks are uh, living longer and have a pretty good prognosis with the type of treatment that we have available these days. Um, nearly all patients can be returned to normal functioning lives with the appropriate therapy. Uh, the typical therapy that we use is acetylcholine esterase medications, immunosuppressive agents, you can consider a thymectomy, or even plasmapheresis or IVIG. Your first line therapy is always going to be going to an oral acetylcholine esterase medication. In this particular uh, situation, it's going to be peridostigmine. It's going to be your number one go-to medication here. Um, now, everybody has different response to this medication, uh, so some people will have a great response at a small dose, and some people will have um, better responses with high doses. At the same time, you can have patients on high doses with very minimal response. Remember that every patient is an individual and that their therapy is going to need to be individualized. This just gives you some more background information here about the medication. If you pay particular attention here um, to the mechanism itself, uh, it inhibits the destruction of acetylcholine by acetylcholine esterase, which facilitates transmission of impulses across the myoneural junction. Um, some of the things you need to be worried about with this medication would be like cholinergic crisis, which we're going to talk about next bradycardia, hypotension, skin rash. You're also going to see salivation and lacrimation uh, with this medication as well, small pupils, because of its um, uh, ability to um, have a larger amount of um, cholinergic receptors being stimulated. All right, so a major side effect of the acetylcholinesterase medication is something called cholinergic crisis, which is a paradoxical weakening in myasthenia gravis patients caused by this medication. This is extremely rare, and it is not common. It's so rare that if you would see a patient with increased weakness while on the medication, you should consider that the myasthenia gravis is getting worse long before you should consider cholinergic crisis. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider it, but it's more likely that the myasthenia gravis is actually getting worse versus you actually having a cholinergic crisis. Just keep that in mind. In addition to the acetylcholine esterase medication, you can do chronic immunotherapies, which would be your second line drug. Most patients tend to be on um, some type of uh, oral steroid. Um, we found with uh, moderate to high doses, it can lead to remission in about 30% of patients, and about 50% of these patients tend to have some type of marked improvement. However, keep in mind that 50% of patients on high doses of steroids can actually deteriorate about 10 days after the therapy has started. Why that is, I'm not 100% certain. That's just some of the data that's available right now. You can do uh, plasmapheresis and uh, IVIG. These are considered to be rapid immunotherapies, and they're typically used for people who are in the middle of a crisis situation or need some type of a bridge uh, when they're switching from one immunotherapy to another. Uh, they both work pretty quickly, uh, but they are short-term in nature. So as I stated on the previous slide, these rapid immunotherapies are reserved for people in a myasthenic crisis. Uh, they're typically given sometimes folks preoperatively, used as a bridge uh, to slower-acting immunotherapies, and they're periodically used to maintain remission in patients on existing chronic immunotherapies. A thymectomy is a surgical option that you can consider in a patient with myasthenia gravis. Now, there's two types of surgical options or treatments that involve the thymus gland. One is a removal of a thymoma, uh, and that's particularly to prevent the spread of it. Even if that's potentially linked to it, it's something that, or to the myasthenia gravis, it's something that you can consider. 
or you can just do a full-blown thymectomy, which is typically the treatment for folks with myasthenia gravis. Recommended for patients puberty through age 55, not 55% age 55. Um, younger than that or older than that remains a debate right now. There's, there's mixed and conflicting data out there at this point. 85% of patients experience some type of improvement, and about 33% are able to re- re- achieve a drug free remission. So in folks with myasthenia gravis, the surgical treatment of choice here is a thymectomy. All right? Not for everybody, but it is something that you can consider. All right, folks, that sums up our discussion today on myasthenia gravis. I hope you were able to take some important points from this presentation. By all means, feel free to go back and review anything that wasn't clear. And as always, you can email me or come see me if you have any further questions. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.